Welcome to Issues at Hand. Today, my name is Bruno Edgard, and uh, Issues at Hand is proudly brought to you by Protea Hotel in Tebe. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We have a very good discussion coming your way. Now, uh, number one, uh, you can send us uh, a message, a WhatsApp message on 0787447684. This is an interactive program. We want to hear from you on the issue that we are discussing today. And number two, the issue that we are discussing today is the role of religious leaders when it comes to the fight against HIV AIDS. Faith is very important when it comes to that fight and we want to know what religious leaders can do to ensure, we as religious leaders can do to ensure that this fight continues strong. And uh, my guest for today is Dr. Nelson Musoba. He is a Director General of Uganda AIDS Commission. Welcome to Issues at Hand. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and good morning to our viewers and listeners. Fantastic. Um, uh, before we get into the discussion proper, uh, tell us a little bit about Uganda AIDS Commission. You, thank you again. Now, the Uganda AIDS Commission is uh, a government agency, government of Uganda agency. It was established by law of parliament in 1992 and its key mandate is to coordinate the multi-sector HIV response to bring together players uh, across government but also outside government you know private sector private not-for-profit to ensure that the message around HIV goes out to ensure we put place policy in place policy strategy and uh, outline you know the roles for each stakeholder that for this problem this is how we are going to approach it and this private sector will be responsible for this faith sector will be responsible for this, government will do the following. So largely that is our role. You can call us the giraffe, and you know we, we are not an implementing agency, but we have agencies that do the implementation, the Minister of Health, does public health, the Minister of Education, and, and all the other departments doing their different pieces. And uh, thank you, thank you for that. And we shall continue to discuss. Uh, maybe you'll continue to tell us a little about a little bit about how uh, the Uganda AIDS Commission is partnership partnering with religious leaders to continue this fight against HIV AIDS. Now uh, we watched uh, an amazing song right there by Phile Bolongoli Retire, and uh, that song, uh, which is now called an anthem, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the fight against HIV. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that was back in the 70s and the 80s, but maybe mm -hmm. you can give us a brief history on HIV AIDS in Uganda. Yes, it's, uh, this year is 40 years since the first case of, uh, of AIDS then was discovered in Uganda. It was in 1982 in Kalisizo Hospital. Uh, the patient was coming from the shores of Lake Victoria, Kasensero, in Rakai then. And uh, before that, you know, there had been various stories and descriptions. People were dying of a mysterious disease and uh, the causes had not been understood. People thought it was witchcraft. They thought, you know, this disease coming from Tanzania. But when our epidemiologists started, you know, writing down and defining how it was presenting and looking at other parts of the world and lining this up, so the first case was, uh, was found then. And uh, 40 years down the road, we've, you know, and in the, that was in Eita too, like I said, so in the 80s, the HIV prevalence was quite high. It was a double-digit figure, 18% prevalence. So out of every 100 people, 18 would be positive. That's on average. But we had subpopulation groups, uh, especially groups that are at high risk of HIV. If you're looking at uh, the fisher folks, if you're looking at commercial, sex workers, the truck drivers, where prevalence was as high as 40%. You know, so for every 100 people, 40 of them would be HIV positive. Now, prevalence has come down to 5.5. And uh, back then, there was no treatment, you know. The mainstay of, uh, of uh, keeping us alive was prevention. It was ABC. That was that. That campaign was started right here in Uganda. Uh, it was a, a huge abs campaign. Yeah. Yes, it was a huge campaign. It was adopted globally, A for abstinence, meaning that... Uh, until you're fully an adult and you're sexually active, abstain from sex. Be being faithful. If you get an adult, you get your partner, 
stick to your partner. Of course, first test, know the status of each of you, and then stick to your partner. And then see in the event that either you're a discordant couple, but you must remain in a, in a relationship, or you must engage sexually with somebody whose status you're not aware of, then use a condom. So that, you know, pushed us for a decade, no, two decades, because it was still early 2000 that our people, 2003-04, is when we start, Uganda started accessing antiretroviral therapy on a large scale. And uh, we've made a lot of progress. Prevalence is now down to 5.5%, but we still have new infections. We have people are on antiretroviral therapy, you know, a medication that turns your life around. You know, you're able to live a normal life. There's no cure yet, so it doesn't cure you. It suppresses the virus until it's undetectable. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about, so if you take your medication well, the virus will disappear from the blood. You will not turn HIV negative. So that needs to be clear. You will remain with the virus, but you are not able to pass it on to your partner. Even a pregnant mother can have a baby who is HIV negative if she's taking her medication well. So we've come that far, but we, the fight is still on. Because like I've said, there's no cure, there's no vaccine, and uh, we have approximately 1.4 million Ugandans now uh, living with HIV. And more than 95% of those are on treatment. We still have a small portion of about 150,000 people who are not on treatment. They are out there, and the health workers and the system works hard to be able to reach them to get to make sure that they are in the system and that's why we need this partnership partnership with you know like the faith organizations because we know that through different platforms we are able to get the message to the people there's somebody out there who is not sure either they are hesitating to go and test because they are not sure what the outcome is they have their doubts they have the questions or when they test and they are positive, they are not yet enrolling on treatment. Again, they are hesitating. There's this whole question of stigma, which you know keeps people away from accessing services. And, and that is now the battle that we need to work on so that uh, we have everyone on treatment because we've, uh, we've made a commitment that by 2030, like to end the AIDS. And what does that mean? It means that uh, we stop new infections. Those who have it don't pass it on. And they can do that by just taking their medication diligently, ensuring that you know they are faithful to their partners. The young people who have been born with it, unfortunately, those you know whose mothers were not able to access treatment, you know, they do the they abstain until they are adults. Uh, they are not denied from, you know, once they are adults getting into union and getting married, but it's possible, like I've said, for them to get partners and get HIV negative babies as long as they just listen to the instructions of the health worker. So that's where we've come. We've had an amazing journey. Uganda continues to be a leader globally in terms of, you know, not just the rest of public health, but especially HIV people look to us. They listen to us, they, you know, we are always having innovations, you know, from the governance side. Our president was the first to come out in this region, but also globally because people were other, you know, uh, other governments were worried, what will it mean for tourism? What will it mean for my people? And we know countries where, because they did not make those decisions early, as we talk now, they are struggling still with a huge burden, a double-digit figure. A country like South Africa, South Africa has more resources than Uganda, for instance, but their prevalence still hovers around 12 or 13 percent because originally there was a time where they did not agree uh, that um, the HIV virus was the cause of the AIDS disease, and it took them miles back. So. There are things that seem simple and straightforward, you know, like the leadership coming out, owning, and then the rest of the citizens follow. So we will continue to do that to, to make sure that we can reach that journey of ending AIDS by 2030. 
Wonderful. And then uh, amongst the many institutions that fight uh, HIV and AIDS, why religion? And why are specifically religious leaders? Uh, thank you for that uh, great question. Now, as Uganda AIDS Commission, we said you have this huge responsibility. You are coordinating stakeholders in the country. How do you go about it? So we grouped our stakeholders into, you know, similar, those who have similar mandates. And we have 12 of such categories. And they include the government ministries, departments, and agencies are one category. The development partners are another category. Civil society overall, but also people living with HIV are grouped into two different categories. Uh, at the cultural institutions, uh, the global fund. Now, the faith-based organization is, is a very specific category because we know of their uniqueness. You know, we, we know that one, they have a positive uniqueness is, is what I'm talking about. They have a very large following. We've been informed that um, uh, the faith sector, you know, every week when you begin from, you know, Friday, the Juma in the mosques to, to, to Saturday for those, uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists and the others, up to the end of Sunday, Sunday the, through the faith platform, they reach up to 18 million Ugandans, you know, just in a, in a set of just those few days. But they have various, if you looked at the Christian faith, especially the, I can speak about the Anglican faith where where I subscribe, I know that within there, there are again subdivisions. You have the youth mission, you have, you know, father's union, you have mother's union, you have uh, the, the cell mission. So there are opportunities through which working with leaders, you can get the message direct to the individuals, to the young people, where as a commission, it wouldn't be easy. You know, we can still put messages out there First of all, it matters what the message is, who is carrying the message, and how it is putting across. And we found, you know, we formed this close relationship. And at the beginning of the epidemic, again, there were challenges, there were discussions around, you know, the ABC, because again, within the faiths, there are different beliefs. You know, should we use a condom or shouldn't we? What does it mean? Is it mean, you know, you're giving somebody a license to go ahead and do whatever they want? And we had leadership. Uh, one of the, the, the chairpersons, the first chairpersons of the Uganda AIDS Commission was Bishop Misair Kauma. You know, between uh, 1995 to 1997, you know, he, he led us, you know, he provided the guidance at a very unique time when there was no treatment, a diagnosis of, of, of AIDS was almost a death sentence. And later on, we had another Catholic bishop, you know, uh, uh, from Kavale, Bishop Barnabas Haleimana, again for a period of time, leading the commission. So we've, have, we've had a long partnership, but also the, the faith organization have made huge invest investments in health. You know, we have... Uh, more than 13 health professional training schools that belong to the faith sector. We have more than, you know, 1,000 health facilities from hospitals to, you know, health center fours, threes, uh, that belong to the, 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 different, the, the, the faith sector. So we are talking about a partner who is not just uh, paying lip, lip service, but who is as invested in this sector of health and HIV and, and therefore, which other better way to partner than work with someone who has actually real interest, who has investments. And when you speak to the faith leaders, they will tell you they would like to lead a health population. And, and, uh, and therefore, that is where our partnership springs from. It has yielded fruit, and, uh, and we think we can even uh, consolidate it further to ensure that uh, we think faith will play a critical role if we are to achieve uh, uh, this goal of ending AIDS by 2030. By 2030. The, the science has its part. You know, the science has done a great deal. We've had the pills. We have all these technologies coming in, you know, for us. But for you to apply that science and to ensure that the population comes and utilizes it and explains it, faith comes in there so that, uh, you know, you can make the science to reach the community. 
Ah, definitely. And so, what is the plan when it comes to getting religious leaders to participate in this fight against HIV AIDS? So we've, uh, we've had conversations again with the, the faith leaders. Fortunately, the faith leaders themselves have formed a group that uh, is known as the Interreligious Council of Uganda. And the Interreligious Council of Uganda brings faith leaders from the different categories, you know, from the Anglican Church, from the Catholic Church, the Muslims, the Orthodox, the Pentecostals, you know, there are around 12 of such leaders they have signed on to that. Uh, of course, the RCU does more than just health. You know, they, are, they have also worked in areas of governance and other development aspects. But our partnership with them, with the Interreligious Council, is around health and HIV. And, uh, you know, we work with, the, they rotate the leadership. The, the, the current uh, president of the Interreligious Council of Uganda is the Archbishop. Uh, the, the right uh, reverend Dr. Stephen Kazimba Mugalu, who is now. So we've come together and we've developed a plan. It is called the Faith Based Action Plan. And inside this plan, it lays out interventions. How do we deal with stigma and discrimination? How do we ensure access you know, to services that the people have the messages? How do we reach out? So we have you know, a plan, it is very well costed. And uh, together now we are saying, how do we find resources to ensure that this plan is implemented? Already before that, we came out with a simplified communication called the pastoral letter. And the pastoral letter is really a breakdown of what is it, if you're talking about HIV, what is HIV? What are the causes of it? How does one get infected with HIV? How do you prevent yourself uh, from getting HIV? And the, this was intended to ensure that every leader, whether you are an imam, you know, going to, 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 to work on, on with, with your community, you just pick this up and you're able to look through it and communicate this message. So from the pastoral leader, we, we now have a fully-fledged plan that we would like to use, and this will contribute to ensuring that we meet the targets that we've set out. In the, in, the, in the strategic plan uh, and, and that is how, how we are trying to, to, to implement our collaboration and relationship with the faith sector. Yes, uh, are there key things that are uh, outlined in this plan apart from the pastoral letter that are going to uh, move this uh, fight forward especially when it comes to uh, the participation of religious leaders? Yeah, we've, uh, we've outlined some key areas uh, within the faith-based plan that we'd like to, you know, to tackle. One of them would like to enhance access to HIV stigma reduction because we've realized that stigma is such a huge issue. I can tell you that in this country, despite the HIV services being at the all levels, people still move long distances. People do not want to go to where they are known, where either the health workers know them or the people who work within the health facility know them. So people are moving from Barara to access services here in Kampala, or even, you know, from Jinja to access here, and the Kampala ones are moving elsewhere. And that disrupts because if for some reason you can't travel to refill your pills, then it means you'll miss your treatment and your viral load will go up. So stigma is such a key issue and, uh, and would like to, and we'll do that by ensuring that we, we disseminate HIV prevention messages to adolescents, to young people, to adults, to key populations and, and to the leaders themselves. The second area of intervention that we are going to work with, the, that is spelled out in the action plan is uh, sexual and gender-based violence. It still remains a key issue. It's, uh, you know, studies have shown that uh, uh, sexual and gender-based violence is quite prevalent, and yet we know that where violence exists, it raises the chances of uh, contracting HIV. We saw during COVID how the teenagers, you know, uh, the teenage pregnancy was very high. These young people do not make decisions, you know. They didn't willingly engage into these relationships. They were pushed in 
either through pressure of the need, you know, to access food, they needed some money. So defilement falls into all those categories of violence. And we think that through the faith leaders, we can work with them to disseminate information. We can, you know, require those cultures where there is marriage of underage children for that to be addressed. Of course, we like to amplify the advocacy for the voice of faith and religious leaders on structural barriers. Structural barriers are really these underlying factors, you know, things of our beliefs, saying that, you know, when a girl is 15 and she starts menstruating, then she's ready for marriage. We think that, you know, faith leaders can help us change some of those beliefs, uh, uh, the patriarchal aspects of, you know, where wealth distribution is unequal. You find that the female gender uh, has always has difficulty accessing resources, ensuring that children can stay in school long enough. That enables them to acquire skills, but also by the time they leave, then they are ready to, you know, to, to be able to deal with all these inequities. And, uh, and uh, so staying in school is, is a key area. And then the other area is just to work with the faith leaders to ensure that this information, because the one platform where we can start is to make sure leaders have information and correct information so that they are able to spread it to, to, to the rest of the population that they, they, that they lead within the faith organization. So we've outlined those different areas and we, we are pretty confident and we worked on these areas together with the faith leaders. It's not that we sat down as Ugandan's commission and wrote this down, you know, we worked with them. We've developed this plan together. It was launched on the 1st of, of December 2021 and indeed we are now ready to, to, to go out and we've started implementing. We just need to ensure that it is implemented to full scale so that it can have the desired impact that uh, we, we've, we've planned to, to have done out there. And uh, by full scale, you mean to uh, towards the different religious sects? Which yes. religious sects are we looking at uh, specifically? Well, we've uh, first of all, we have the main categories. We have uh, the Church of Uganda, which is the Anglican faith. We have the Catholics. We have the Muslim faith. We have the Pentecostal Church. We have the Orthodox. Uh, within the Pentecostals, there are subcategories. You know, there is... Um, because among the leaders there, we have uh, Pastor Dr. Joseph Serwada, we have uh, Bishop Luere, we have, so they, within the Pentecostals, there are again subdivisions of, of the different categories. But we'd like to, to, to use faith, you know, especially those who are fully recognized and, and they have, you know, populations out there. Because also, if you don't give them information, the negative things, we, we've, we've received messages, for instance, that uh, certain faith leaders will preach to people and say, oh, we, you've, you're healed now, uh, leave your medication, you're now HIV negative. But we know that uh, even when the doctors treat, God heals his people, uh, you know, through it, he, God works medical through, treatment. yeah, works through the doctors to be able to heal the people. So the, I think faith leaders coming from that background need to be given information and to say that you do not have to tell the patients to throw away the pills or to you know to say that you're now testing HIV negative which the science the science is a tool and a power as a result of God's power so we, 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 we you can't separate the two we are able to implement science we are able to access and make these medications because of the power of God I think those interactions are so important and we shall deal with all the main and non-registered, you know, faith organizations. Of course, the entry point is the Interreligious Council of Uganda, but even if those who are not necessarily members and subscribe, that, but we know they exist, we shall reach out to everyone and ensure that they have this messaging and they are part of the campaign. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Now, uh, thank you for taking us through the Faith Action Best Plan. And uh, we shall continue with this conversation, especially uh, we are going to hear from our guest on the National HIV and AIDS Symposium. What is it and what can we expect from the symposium? And my guest today is Dr. Nelson Musowa, who is the Director General of Uganda AIDS Commission. And uh, before the break, we are talking about the Faith Best Action Plan and why it's important for religious leaders leaders to be involved in the fight against HIV and AIDS. Now, uh, Doctor, I would like you to take us through the National HIV and AIDS Symposium. What is it? Uh, when is it? Where is it? And uh, what should we expect from the symposium? Thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Now, every year, uh, Uganda AIDS Commission again coordinates its stakeholders to reflect on what do we go through the previous year calls the different implementers together and uh, they share the experiences so that you know it's a form of accountability but the previous years we've done it differently we usually do it you know in the conference rooms we a smaller group mainly between um, public health professionals and leaders and a few activists now this year we've changed our approach We've, uh, we've called it the National HIV and AIDS Symposium. We've opened it up so that it's open to the public and one will be able to participate either by physically coming or joining virtually. It will be from the 8th to the 10th of November. So it's a few, just a few weeks away, a few days, you know, counting down. And it will be at the open grounds of Makere University Business School, the MOOBS Nakawa campus. That is where it will be. We've invited uh, implementing partners, stakeholders who participate in delivering services to come and share with the public what is it that they have been doing. So one is that as they sh in form of exhibitions. So the researchers, the research teams, the different partners who have been providing services will be able to, to explain during the three-day period. So we've deliberately made it one, three days. We've made it in form of exhibitions. We are having a partnership with a vision group. And uh, the vision group has successfully done similar campaigns, but not in health and HIV. They have done it in other sectors. And we thought that this is a great approach. It takes science closer to the communities. It allows communities to come in and ask questions. We will specifically work with schools, especially those within close proximity, to come because young people need to, you know, have access to this information. They need to come in and ask questions, and uh, and we are expecting more than 100 exhibitors to be there. So it's an opportunity to come in. We will also be commemorating the the Fidel Utaya Day. We still consider Fidel Utaya as one of the greatest heroes, uh, not just in this country, but on the continent and globally because he came out at the most difficult of times. He could have stayed in the comfort. He was a successful musician living in Sweden and uh, he could have just stayed there, you know, quietly like many people did, but he chose and said, no, I will need to share this with the population. And we think that was a, a, an act of, of heroism and bravery. And we decided as, uh, as the commission that we should commemorate him every year. So during the entire three days, we are working with the artists because we also want to show that uh, you can participate in the fight against HIV, not by just being a doctor or a nurse or a laboratory scientist. Whatever profession you do, and Philly demonstrated that. He was, you know, a successful musician and he used music to reach out to the young people. So we've invited artists. We are working. The artist who currently represents them at Uganda AIDS Commission is Joanita Kawalia, our legend with the Africa Band. So we are working with her to involve artists, artists of different categories, both those in the drama, the comedy, but also singing. So we shall have a Philly Retire corner. And we will, you know, for those who will be able to come, we are just working with them to say that this problem still exists and use their voices, you know, to go out. So three-day symposium, uh, 8th to 10th, 
at Makere University Business School Nakawa Campus largely to share the what we've been able to do and take science closer to the community. One of the days will be dedicated to financing because you need the resources to do all these things. As a country, we've been fortunate. We've had a lot of support from donors, but we've also started a discussion that it's time we became ready in the event because this will not be around forever. We need to look at domestic and say, what is it that we need to do to put in more to generate more resources, uh, what can, what additional resources can government contribute, but what else can the others do? <coughs> Already a lot is being done, you know, by private sector, by individuals, through, you know, medical care to their workers, through messaging like this and providing platforms like this. These are huge contributions, but we need to quantify them and we see what else can be done. So that is the sharing. And learning from that experience, we would like to take on, use that approach for, for, for the subsequent years and probably move it down to, to, to the regional level. But that's how we intend to share during the three days of November. We have lined up uh, uh, keynote, a variety of speakers, both globally and, and locally. The, the Right Honorable Prime Minister will be the chief guest, but you know we have in-house people who are coming to speak. The U.S. Ambassador will come to speak. Other key partners will come to speak, you know, leaders from UNAIDS, the regional office, uh, we've invited the Global Fund, but our own artists and activists and young people will be there presenting and sharing experiences of what has happened. In fact, uh, one of the keynote speakers, we've invited uh, Pastor Wilson Bugembe, who has agreed to speak because we know that he has his own following of the young people. So we, we've lined up, you know, interesting uh, speakers and I would like to to invite uh, the public that if you can't come physically then we will be able to share the details where you can log in and and follow and be able to 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 watch and participate in the symposium is there an interest fee uh, you can participate uh, in different ways now just entrance to watch is free but you can sponsor to be able to exhibit, you'd have to pay a fee to contribute, you know, to you, so that we are able to, and, and we've patterned the vision group to organize all that. So you can sponsor, but, or you can, you know, come in and exhibit, or you can just come as a participant to receive information. And for you to do that, like the school children to be able to participate will not charge them fees. Like a member of the public to come in will not charge you fees, but will it's better for you to register in advance so that we are able to plan for the numbers of, uh, of people who, who are coming and I'll be sharing information on, on how you can log on and, and be able to register. Maybe I can share it now? Definitely, definitely. The information, and if you can write it down so that you can, uh, you can beam it on the screen, is uh, www.nhas2022 nhas 2022.usc.go.ug. If you log on to that link, it will take you direct to where you can access the program. You will see various things, but there will be a place where you can click to register. And the registration will direct you whether you want to register as an exhibitor, as a sponsor, or just as a participant. When you say a sponsor, what do you mean by uh, a sponsor? A sponsor is, uh, you know, you can support this symposium by providing, and there are sponsorship packages, uh, platinum, gold, and silver. And once you provide that financial support, you, one, your logo will be included on all the adverts that will be running. And, uh, and you know, you'll have to, there will be banners, you'll be recognized for this. But you would also have contributed to information going out there and therefore to the reduction of HIV and AIDS. So a sponsor is really somebody who is saying, this is good, I would like this to go ahead. And uh, the vision group is reaching out, you know, to different categories of stakeholders so that that happens. But uh, uh, a sponsor really is somebody who comes in with financial support to say, this is a good cause and I would like to be part of it.
Wow, wonderful. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to the symposium and uh, we know that it's going to be, we should all be there so that uh, we uh, join in understanding um, and uh, fighting this uh, issue of uh, HIV and AIDS. And when it comes to this fight, what are some of the challenges that uh, Uganda AIDS Commission has faced when it comes to taking this fight against HIV and AIDS? Uh, great question again, Bruno. One of the key challenges we've had, as like I spoke earlier on, is financing. We've been largely funded by donors over the last, uh, you know, uh, 40 years. Uganda puts in money, the government of Uganda puts in money. Currently, it puts in the equivalent of about uh, $80 million every year towards ARVs. Our total need every year is somewhere in the range of about 530 million dollars for us to be able to buy medicines test kids uh, do all the testing services and all everything else that is needed but the other bulk so uganda's contribution is about 12 of 13 percent of what the total need is uh, so that includes resources for doing prevention and coordination work for instance i would love to ensure that you know once we have agreed the faith-based plan should be translated in different languages, broken down into different forms of presentation, so that as the leaders present, uh, you know, it is a simplified format. But you need money to do all that, and, you know, those are all resource gaps. Uh, so uh, resources remain one. Two, there's general fatigue. You know, 40 years after you've been talking about the same thing, sometimes I'm sure... You've heard people say, ah, ah, this Uganda AIDS Commission, people just want to make money. They even talk about it for COVID and Ebola, that this Ministry of Health people are uh, ramping this campaign because they make money out of it. So complacency, uh, skepticism, it naturally happens when people listen to something for a long time. And a bit of, co when the medicines came in the early 2000s, because of that complacency, we actually saw uh, HIV prevalence almost going back. We had to come in, you know, and and ramp up again. Then the third challenge is that the young people, you know, young people below 30 who were born after the, the, the epidemic was glaring, now the epidemic, because of medication and the technology, it presents differently. So when you're talking about HIV, they really do not understand why you're making this such a big issue. I'm sure you've had uh, that saying, young people saying, I'd rather get HIV than get pregnant because the pregnancy is visible. So again, messaging, ensuring that the message is made, made louder, it's made visible, it's made relevant, and, and goes out. So it's financing, it is complacency, it is messaging, and it is, uh, you know, uh, ensure, and messaging will address a number of things, including the cultural issues, the information age, young people see, are exposed to a lot of information, you know, from different places and uh, they want to experiment, they want to do all kinds of things. So we, we need to very aggressively go out with messages. So those are some of the challenges that we are facing. And uh, we, uh, we are engaging government and the parliament to ensure that the financing side of things gets addressed, that we can't continue to rely on donors to fund some of the most critical parts of our, of, of our response, that really things like treatment, should be coming from our government so that in the event that the donor changes their mind that you know they no longer see this as a priority your people will be protected there will be no danger that they are being exposed all right and uh, finally uh, give us a final remark on uh, this um, topic of uh, the role of religious leaders when it comes to the fight against hiv and aids and also the role of the public what as uh, community members, different uh, leaders in different spheres and uh, in the general public, religious leaders or not, can we do to take this fight against HIV AIDS? Thank you very much. So I would like to first of all appreciate the faith leaders and uh, because of the role that they have already played and call on them that there is still a lot of work for us out there. Uh, 2030 is so close now. But we've made these ambitious commitments. I think we can still achieve them. We need to have to all go out and harness the population. To the public, HIV is still a problem. It's still here with us. And uh, 
it's not something that somebody else out there will do, government. It is, begins with you. Take responsibility, go and test your HIV, uh, to know your HIV status. And if you find yourself negative, then take, make sure that you maintain your negative status by, you know, always uh, sticking to doing the right things. If you find yourself positive, go to the health facility. The health workers will cancel you and start you on the medication. Uh, if, you're, if you turn out positive, it's not the end of the world. Take care of your loved ones, take care of the children. Let's minimize stigma. We can end AIDS by 2030. I thank you. I thank Family TV for hosting me this morning. Thank you, Dr. Nelson Musowa, Director General of the Uganda AIDS Commission, for giving us that message of hope. And uh, there is hope indeed for our country when it comes to tackling different issues. And uh, this time, uh, the issue we are talking about today was the fight against HIV and AIDS. And we continue to pray for every family out there and for every Ugandan out there that this will become an issue no more by 2030. We are believing in faith. Thank you for joining us uh, on issues at hand today. Uh, we shall return on Friday. For now, God richly bless you.